Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to Wednesday evening's online seminar with Silver Shebbing Sash. Today or this evening we are joined by John Sharp who is going to be talking to us about the JCT Constructing Excellence contract and discussing whether or not it will catch on. As always, uh, John will answer questions at the end of his presentation. If you could submit these in the Q&A uh, tool in the bottom toolbar, um, and he will endeavour to answer as many of those as possible at the end of the presentation. So without any further ado, John, would you like to take it away, please? Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the JCT Constructing Excellence Contract 2016. Um, well, I'll let you form your own view about it, but this is an overview of it. So um, I, shall, I shall begin, if you'll forgive me, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, that's me. I'm on the website. I said about him the better, really. Um, but what we're going to look at today, we'll have an introduction to the JCT Constructing Excellence contracts and why it came about, etc. Yes, I know you're all going to faint, but the whole purpose behind the JCT Constructing Excellence contract is that we all collaborate with each other. So we're all going to get on very well. We're not going to argue. It's all going to be done in a collaborative manner to build the best possible building. Okay? Um, then we're going to look at exactly what the JCT Constructing Excellence contract tries to do. Then we'll look at its criticisms. And then at the end, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them in the time that's available. So, why did we get a JCT Constructing Excellence contract? Well, in 2016, as the UK recovered from the worst of the most recent recession, that is when the demand for construction and infrastructure services increased, it was evident that some clients in the industry were looking at ways of tendering for work delivering and delivering construction services which will deliver improved long-term value to clients and more realistic margins to contractors, supply chain members and professional teams. There's a slight caveat to all of this talk in that because this is relatively new, for example, it hasn't really got before the courts at the moment for them to interpret it. Um, so, as I said, it is all fairly new. But of course, is it going to be the way forward? This collaborative approach to working where we all work together, we have a, a, a board sitting in the background that governs the project. Is it, is it the way forward? Are we all going to be working together in the future? Obviously at a safe distance. So, well, why are we thinking about collaborating? Well, a collaborative approach to the new technology that's available to us all. And there was also pressure put on governments to change the approach to tenders from being a combative one, where everyone pitches in and fights each other for it, to being more of a collaborative one, of saying, well, we will work with these two other parties to deliver a better service for you all. And supposedly, collaborative working will assist with the proper assessment of risk division between all parties. Now, I'm going to not read this next section, but this is one example of the benefits of collaboration. And I've called it the good. Um, I'll let you read it in your own time. But if you read through these pages, you will see that if you do work together, then you can sometimes avoid problems and all come out of it looking very well. So, in this case, they set up a workshop to look at the delivery of what were effectively very large items of kit for use in a Navy yard. And they concluded that any delay in delivery due to bad weather would incur the contractor high cost due to the daily higher charges of the barges that were needed, about 20,000 a day. And also they worked how the naval ship movements within the dockyards might inhibit the ability to offload the semi-submersibles, which were also needed, and additional higher costs would also be to the contractor's account. So they worked together to work out in collaboration with each other the best way to cure these problems. In the end, the Cassian was successfully constructed with some delay in delivery to bad weather, 
Once at the dockyard, whilst the contractor wasn't able to deliver the Cassian into the basin due to military restrictions, the MOD were able to take it over with three of their own tugs and position the Cassian outside the basin at no additional cost to the contractor. Now that was all because they all sat together, worked out what the problems were, and worked out a solution to it. So collaboration, especially on more complicated um, projects, can work. So what are the barriers to change? Why is it that this contract, and indeed other more collaborative contracts, have not caught on? Well, there is, of course, of course the comfort of familiar commercial and contractual structures. Everyone knows what the relationships are between them in a more traditional KCT contract. There's a perception that collaboration is likely to be more costly and um, resource hungry. Construction companies, especially if a company has been set up as an SPV, have short-term goals, especially in their own involvement in the project, is likely to be short-term. KPIs still tend to be more stick than carrot, often based around one-sided requirements, dressed up as partnering and collaboration. And fragmentation within the industry and its numerous bodies and organisations make it difficult for a clear lead to come from any one consistent source. There's also reluctance by clients and their advisors to engage in a process which is likely to lead to a loss of client control if decision making becomes more collective. So by a project board as opposed to the client themselves. There are still insufficient commercial incentive, incentives for industry professionals and contractors to change their working habits. There's currently a lack of adequate training in the potential benefits of collaborative working techniques and the ingredients required. Very few professional bodies or academic institutions seem truly prepared to advocate and to promote new approaches. There's a lack of strong industry leadership with too few high profile industry professionals prepared to commit to advocating real change and creating an environment where change is positively encouraged. There's an absence of standard form construction contracts and professional terms of appointment which truly embrace collaborative working. Most agreements incorporating collaborative techniques are either bespoke or heavily adapted from existing, more traditional forms. And importantly, given the current insurance market situation, existing insurance models are well established and for the most part, the insurance community prefers the comfort of the familiar. It likes to insure what it knows about and not the unknown. So what needs to change to get more collaboration into the construction industry? Well, there needs to be greater commitment to change from major industry clients, the government itself, and public sector clients, and from the industry as a whole. There needs to be BIM adoption, the continued use and development of BIM, in particular greater clarity at the outset of projects as to when and how BIM is to be incorporated into the procurement, design, construction, and operational phases. The government's recent, not quite so recent now, ladies and gentlemen, commitment to fund the evolution of BIM to level three is welcome contribution to its future development. Strong leadership. There needs to be strong and consistent leadership from industry bodies and key industry figures which go out and actively promote the idea of collaborating, of working together on projects. There needs to be greater emphasis on effective team working, greater attention to effective team working structures and techniques, and their role in a more collaborative project environment. New contractual structures, ensuring that contractual structures and obligations enhance and support a more collaborative working environment by focusing on positive project outcomes and reducing the blame culture, which dominates more traditional contract structures. 
changing the risk profile, challenging whether a risk profile which normally places a significant element of risk on the contractor is sensible in an environment which requires innovation, participation and cooperation of all core project team members in order to maximise client value and long-term cost efficiencies. Involving key supply chain members, actively engaging with and involving key supply chain members in the core project team and in the collaborative structures. That's something that isn't done very much at the moment, if at all. When people are bidding for contracts, do they speak to the suppliers and say, we're bidding for this contract, when can you supply the goods? Do they speak to logistic companies and say, we're ordering this many things, how long do you think it will take to get to the uh, location of the construction? And by the way, uh, can you get it there? Because uh, there's a narrow bridge, what's going on? Don't do that. Knowledge centers, creating standards for best practice guidance in effective collaboration techniques and structures. Training, training for industry professionals, in particular architects, quality surveyors and project managers in collaborative work techniques. Measuring success differently, measuring the success of projects on the basis of overall life cycle cost, sustainability and energy efficiency as opposed to outturn construction cost against budget and anticipated tender prices. There needs to be a willingness to devolve management control from client to core project team. So encouraging construction clients to be prepared to devolve management of projects to a core project team, even if it means a reduction in control. There needs to be an evolution of the quantity surveyor's role, development of the traditional QS role to include greater emphasis on long-term asset value and life cycle cost. Rewarding success, encouraging construction clients to be willing to reward and incentivize project team members and key supply chain members by giving all key players a financial stake in the project success against the greed benchmarks and targets. Not something that we're all desperately good at at the moment. There needs to be development of new key performance indicators, developing KPIs which define success and which measure, recognize and incentivize performance above benchmark levels as well as penalizing poor performance. Development of new standard form contracts, developing standard form construction contracts in terms of appointment for professional team members which encourage and embrace collaborative behaviors. And there needs to be new insurance models, development of insurance models, including the integrated project insurance model, which recognizes that collaborative techniques and emphasis on providing long-term solutions for clients may reduce overall project risk, whilst at the same time placing additional collective obligations on all core team members. Now, if in an ideal world all that was to happen, and we were to get all these things in place, would it stop the bad? Well, a risk manager received a telephone call from a project manager on a large commercial project development. He explained to the risk manager that his project was coming to an end, he was being transferred to a new project. He went on to explain that at the commencement of his current project some 18 months earlier, he'd undertaken a risk workshop for the project, would like to unstake one for his next project. The risk manager thought he had found a true risk convert who had adopted the process and then seen the full benefits that that process can bring. However, that thought soon passed when the project manager went on to explain that he was sure that he had a copy of the risk register somewhere and he would try and find it to see if any of the identified risks had occurred. The project manager gained some of the benefits of the benefits of risk management, clearly not all. The workshops had helped the project team gain a better understanding of his project aims and assisting in building the project and building the team. If he had used the register as a tool to manage the risks, assisting in his decision making or setting the appropriate levels of contingency for his project, he would have clearly gained the full benefits. The risk register was not reviewed during the course of the project 
and the risks that were identified at the beginning of the project would have changed significantly throughout the construction life cycle. Furthermore, the learning from the risks that have been successfully mitigated would have been recorded for future reference on his next project. So, what exactly is the JCT Constructing Excellence contract? I think you've probably, hopefully, all gathered by now, as I've been talking to myself for the last few minutes, that it's all about collaboration, and that differs significantly from the other standard form JCT contracts, which you've all, I'm sure, been using. So the approach, well, the contracts were drafted to underpin collaborative working are intended to, surprisingly enough, encourage collaborative behaviour, get participants to recognise the importance of risk management at the pretender stage, provide some flexibility in use, and be used throughout the supply chain. Now, these objects are going to be achieved through a series of bilateral contracts that adopt a collaborative approach within a common framework, a multi-party project team agreement, which reinforces a collective approach, use of a risk register, and flexible allocation of identified risks to the party best able to manage the consequences of a problem going wrong. So instead of all risks going onto the contractor, the idea is that everyone who's taking part in the project shares a bit of the risk. So there is a pain gain share mechanism. Now, integral to the Constructing Excellence contract, in my view, is a project team agreement. But it is optional in the JCT Constructing Excellence contract. It's intended for use by all parties, including clients, contractors, consultants, or subcontractors of any tier. Parties now are referred to in this contract as purchaser and supplier. Provision for key personnel of supplier and members of the supply chain to be part of a project team. There are design obligations and alternative standards of care. And there is, of course, your risk register and risk allocation schedule. There are performance indicators. They've installed into the JCT Constructing Excellence contract an overriding principle of good faith, mutual trust, and respect. Sure, we can all do that. Dispute resolution provisions are put in there to resolve any disagreements between the, before the parties proceed. There's a protocol governing the whole project. There are alternative payment options, target costs requires a separation of empirical costs and the agreed margin. And there are collateral warranties or transfer TPRs. It's based on cost and not price. It has an emphasis on identifying and managing risks. And there's an encouragement to arrange a single policy of insurance to cover the whole project and all parties involved in it. That, I'm afraid, at the moment will be exceptionally difficult to do. Proper planning of the construction period. So early engagement of key suppliers a suggestion of a two-stage approach. Now that, to my mind, does make some sense. So the parties who have successfully um, tendered for a project under a JCT Constructing Excellence contract are encouraged to meet early. So before they can even start work on the site, to sit around a table and to talk through the project and to see what problems that they might envisage. They're also supposed to engage early with the supply chain people. So people who are actually going to supply the items and equipment which are going to be used to build the building. 
and also those who are going to deliver it to the site. Now that, to my mind, makes some sense. There's also measurement of relevant performance as the work proceeds. So contract documents see that there are conditions, bilateral agreements and contractors. The project team agreement can be entered into once a project team is established. It sets out in greater detail than the conditions of functions and role of the project teams and allows for sharing of risks. And all parties should be part of that project team. Now, I can foresee in a project team that someone will eventually have to lead it. So some people, I think to use an old joke, will be more important than others. But nevertheless, it would be a great step forward in my view if every party to a construction project was to sit around the table and to discuss how the project's going, what are we going to do next, etc. Accepting, of course, that if a project team has to sign off on um, invoices, etc., then it's too cumbersome to have everyone doing that. Some parts will have to be delegated to one particular person. However, the contract's good because it does have some robust contractual provisions. It enforces the overriding principle, which I mentioned earlier, of mutual trust, respect, etc. The documents are there to en engage all the project participants, encouraging people to enter into a project team agreement prepare a project protocol. So how are we all going to deal with each other during the course of this construction project? Deals with the provision of information to all parties involved in the project. Identifies design obligations on all parties. And clearly sets out the role of the lead designer and the lead supplier. It involves the key personnel and the supply chain. It has provisions that deal with the supply of goods and materials. It has attached to it a risk register, though that's not a contractual document, and a risk allocation schedule, a contractual allocation of risk between all the various parties to a particular project. Relief events, so what's going to happen if something goes wrong, measurements of performance, and payment provisions which normally are target cost against contract sum. It deals with insurance, so who's going to arrange the insurance. Completion, there's a completion period and a rectification period after the contract signed. So if anything is wrong, it can be rectified before work commences. There's assignation provisions, warranties of QPR, termination provisions, dispute resolution provisions, so without the need to rush off to an adjudicator, go to court, etc. Early notification, direct negotiation in good faith, statutory adjudication, that's all there before you go to court. And health and safety and a sustainable development. So will it prevent the ugly? Well, I don't know. It might have a go. Again, I'll leave you all to read this in your own time. But I think it might go some way to avoiding some of the problems that we encounter on a reasonably regular basis. We don't want projects delivered 15 weeks late and the contractor made to pay a large payment to the customer. That is something I think we can all agree is something that we would all want to try at least and avoid. Now, maybe the JCT Constructing Excellence contract goes slightly too far on the collaboration front. There are certainly some arguments to say that doing all this collaboration is actually going to make matters worse rather than better. But so I am quite sure in my own mind that some problems experienced on construction sites can be avoided if there is more communication, if nothing else, between the various parties. And so situations as I've outlined here 
can possibly be avoided if there is more collaboration, more communication, and the idea of having a project team meeting once a month, once every two weeks. Surely that has to be a reasonably good idea. Reallocation of risk? Yes. I think it's unfair, and most commentators do, that the contractor bears a great deal of the risk, far more than really he should do. Isn't it time that we thought about allocating certain elements of risk to other parties? After all, we're all in this together in designing what should be and what's supposed to be a really, really, really sophisticated building which complies with new health and safety requirements and above all is sustainable and energy efficient because that after all are now the watchwords of everyone but in particular moving forward. So it won't come as a surprise for you to know that there are considerable criticisms of the JCT Constructing Excellence contract. One commentator has described it slightly unfairly, I think, but nevertheless, possibly slightly accurately, as your granny turning up to your next party, sporting an eyebrow piercing, dreadlocks, and a split. And to some extent, that is true. It is going to take a massive change in the industry before something like the JCT Constructing Excellence contract really does come into its own. It's brave because it applies to clients, main contractors, subcontractors, consultants, and supply chain members. Will we get everyone to accept that a JCT Constructing Excellence contract is the right way forward? Even more so at a time when the industry is still wondering whether it can cope with a single appointment document for consultants. So if nothing else, the JCT Constructing Excellence contract is brave in its ambition. All the familiar terms that we're all used to in relation to contractual arrangements have gone. There are no more clients, no more employers. No more contractors, no more consultants. We're all just purchasers and suppliers. Now that is going to take some getting used to in industry which has been using this term, these terms for many, many years. However, probably the JCT Constructing Excellence contract, and this is where I have come across it, um, in the last two or three years has been primarily intended for the public sector market. The government has told the public sector that it must adopt partnering. It doesn't want any more to have one, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, body governing a contract. It wants people to work together in a more collaborative way to hopefully deliver cost savings, energy efficient programs, and properties that will last a little longer than they do now. However, as I've said, is anyone in charge? The project team, are they gonna be in charge? Well, their job is to guide the successful delivery of the project. But I'm not sure, and I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm not sure that eight people, nine people, ten people possibly sitting around the table are going to drive forward necessarily the delivery of a project. And fundamental to the contract is its treatment of risk. It will allow purchasers and suppliers to pre agree the costs and times allowed within the contract time for named risk events. More interestingly, it will also allow them to pre-allocate the effective cost and time overruns for those events. This is a change 
from the way other contracts work and will certainly take some getting used to. In addition, I think we have to remember the state of the insurance market at the moment, probably the hardest insurance market for years, hard not only in terms of price, but also in terms of what risks it is willing to write. Is it now going to, is it now the time to ask the insurance market to write an insurance policy where various different parties carry the can if something goes wrong? I'm not sure at the moment they have the appetite for doing something like that. Now that may change in a few years time, but certainly at the moment, approaching the insurance market with anything new or novel or unusual is not going to be met with particularly welcome arms. So overall, is the JC Construction Excellence contract worth considering? Well, my view is it is, if nothing else, because I think collaborative work is probably going to be the way forward, whether we like it or not in a few years' time, once we're past the current hiccup in our daily lives. Um, and I think the insurance market will gradually adopt to the idea that there can be risk sharing within a project. But it's certainly worth considering against this competitor contract, NEC or BE, for example, but as it represents such a huge shift away from the traditional JCT approach, it remains to be seen whether the JCT name will be sufficient to give it a market share. The smart money says it will be a niche contract and for what it's worth, ladies and gentlemen, that's my experience of it. I've come across it two or three times. It's certainly not been tested by the courts. And as far as I'm aware, there haven't been any adjudications that this firm's done which has involved it. But I have come across it in relation, to, as I've said, to government and building projects. That's where its use is coming. And given the drive to try and stop the acrimonious relationship between parties in construction projects, it's certainly possibly worth considering. So my conclusions, well, it is rarely used. As I said, I've come across it two or three times, but mainly in relation to government contracts. We certainly have not had a done one yet, so we've not been asked to advise on its wording and changes to a contract or anything like that. But they are being used, don't get me wrong, there are these contracts out there. And as I've said, nor have we had, we had a dispute arising from it, and I've spoken to some other lawyers who, again, work in the construction industry, and they too have not yet had any disputes. Now they wouldn't tell me, obviously, they've had any adjudication, but certainly there hasn't been a court reported case where the JCT Constructing Excellence Contract 2016 has been analyzed. That means that it is slightly risky. It is not something that has been tried and tested, unlike other provisions of the JCT contracts, and once the court has ruled on something, then it is a lot easier to rely upon uh, the terms of that contract because you can do so with some certainty, knowing that the courts at least have looked at that particular clause and have formed a conclusion about it. Ladies and gentlemen, that was actually all I was going to say. If there are any questions, I will do my very best to answer them. But bearing in mind, of course, that, um, as I said, it hasn't been tested by the courts, so it will be very much my view, rather than uh, something I can say, and the court said in, because the court hasn't said anything. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, Julie, you're back. Hello. I am indeed. I never went away, John, honestly. Oh, good. Um, okay, we have um, a, a statement and a question. Um, Someone saying the principle of this contract has been around for ages, and in your opinion, how does this re this form relate to PPC or the alliance forms such as FAC one, etc.? I think it's. I think more than anything else, it's simply a, a competitor, another version. You are the, whoever's asked the question is absolutely right. The ideas have been around for a long time, and there are now various versions of how these ideas of collaborative working etc should be put into practice this is just another one of those 
I'm not saying it's better than the others. I'm not saying it's worse than the others. And it's difficult actually to compare them all because they all start really from different starting points. But I like this one because the other part of my practice is transportation and logistics. And it's rare in any of those contracts that talking to supply chain members and talking to logistics suppliers is positively encouraged within a contract. And I know from my own experience of doing cases that if you don't engage with your supplier or the person that's at the logistic um, operation that's going to supply the materials to the site, that causes problems. So I'm keen on it from that point of view. But is it any better than any of the others? Does it compare well? Well, no, they all come from a different standpoint. All they have at their heart is some form of collaboration between the parties. Okay, thank you very much. That um, appears to be the only question for this evening. So you've obviously done a marvellous job in explaining it all. Um, as always, everyone, this will be available on our YouTube channel, uh, should you feel the need to watch, watch us again. If you have any specific questions for John, please don't hesitate to email him. It's John Sharp, J-O-N Sharp, at silverllp.com. Um, and we hope to see you on a, a seminar again soon. John, thank you very much for your time this evening. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. See you soon. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much.